the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. With your long forgotten name, we call upon you. We call upon you. In the words of the unspeakable language, we call upon you. We call upon you. By the spilt blood of the wicked who walk upon this world sprouting the words of false idols, we call upon you. We call upon you. On the land of the dead harvest, that which brings the earth itself into your service, Yamal. We call upon you. We call upon you. We call upon you. We call upon you. Yamel calls upon you. The Sprouting, a Call of Cthulhu actual play podcast by Blighthouse Studio. Find us on your podcatcher of choice. Hello, and welcome to Vulgar History, of feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Anne Foster, and we're just revisiting uh, episodes from season one of the podcast. The audio has been cleared up because, you know, a lot has changed since I recorded these things. These were recorded in like October 2019. You know, it was pre-COVID world as this podcast is still just, I was figuring out what it was going to be like, although I do think. And when I've been revisiting these episodes, I'm like, oh yeah, that's just how I would say that now. Like, I think the tone is pretty consistent. The thing that's changed the most is the um, audio quality because I started working with Christina Lumagi, who is frankly a wizard, a magician with editing. Do you need a podcast editor? Reach out to her. Anyway, so Christina is clearing up the audio to make it more easy to listen to. I've heard from some people that the audio quality of the first season it's kind of like you got maybe you have to listen to it with, with your ear pods in. Like you can't play it in the car. Like it's a bit cloudy. So anyway, I hope that this audio is better. But it's also an opportunity to revisit um, where I have follow-up information about the content in these episodes. So first of all, this is the Mary Toft episode. This is one that the story of Mary Toft seems to pop up every like few weeks on TikTok. Somebody's just like, did you know about this fucked up story? And and I know that this happens because someone from the Tits Up Brigade is always there commenting, being like, well, your history. And they tag me to be like, you should listen to this. So this is like in the last, whatever, 140 episodes of Vulgar History. This is still to me the most fucked up story. And I feel so bad for Mary Toft, who's not a scandalous person. She just like got suckered into this by these dirt bags around her. Not fun dirt bags, just shitty dirt bags. Ever in the dirt bag. This is the first episode where I said, Messy bitch living for drama about Nathaniel St. Andre. So that's launched a vulgar history catchphrase. But also I wanted to say before we get into this newly re-edited Mary Toff bracket Anne's version, 
is, um, so after the episode came out, I got a really thoughtful message from a listener named Minty that I wanted to read to you because during this episode, you're going to hear just sort of the con- to contextualize what the fuck was up. Like, why did Mary Toft's in-laws think like, we're going to pretend she's giving birth to rabbit parts? Like the question that people are always asking on TikTok is like, why would they, th- how would that make the money? And the whole reason is because this was an era of like, freak shows and like weird medical stuff. And so in the context of that in the podcast, I'm talking about the case of this young boy called Peter, who I describe in the episode as being, quote, severely autistic as sort of an explanation for kind of maybe what was going on with him. He was described in the times like feral, like the wolf boy or whatever. And then I got this message from Minty that I really appreciate. And I always appreciate when I get feedback from you so I can do better. So here's what she says. So uh, Minty just wanted to let me know that there is no such thing as, quote, severely autistic. Autism is not a disease that one can have severely or mildly. It is a neurotype, a.k.a. a type of brain. What might have been referred to as severely autistic would now be referred to as someone with high support needs and or a person with an intellectual disability, as autism and intellectual disabilities are not one and the same. And I really appreciated her telling me that. And she also went on to actually say, and I'll share this part too, she wanted to let me know about a really awesome historical lady. So the concept of mild and severe, quote unquote, autism came from Hans Asperger, a Nazi physician, as he used it as a way to justify eugenics against disabled people. It turns out, though, that all of the good information we have from him is actually based off of the work of a woman named Grunya Sukareva, who had an understanding of autism incredibly similar to the current understanding, which included girls, as girls with autism often go ignored in the modern day. She was incredible. So Minty recommends looking at her Wikipedia page, which I will link in this episode as well. But anyway, this Mary Toft story, it's really distressing. I think triggering on a number of levels, animal cruelty. I'm saying this is like Hepburn is here just being like, hey, I'm a cool cat. I'm like, I know. And I would protect you with my life against Nathaniel St. Andre. Anyway, but I mean, just like gynecological, invasive, non-consensual activities, animal cruelty, murder of rabbits, cats, eels. It's a fucking disgusting story. Um, but it's also in another context, a real wild ride. And I can, I'd say that because like Mary Toft had this horrifying series of horrible things going on in her life. And then at the end, she was just like, okay, I'm just going to go live out the rest of my life. And she was like, seemingly re-entered society and was an okay person. And so that's kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I'm glad that she didn't die through the complications of like (laughs) blood infections from all the stuff that's going on with her. Anyway, I was going to say like, enjoy this episode, but like, (laughs) here, I present this episode, Mary Toft. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History. My name is Anne Foster and this is my feminist women's history comedy podcast and you might notice an improvement or maybe just like a change or a difference in the audio quality and that is I watched a tutorial on how to use my microphone and I think I'm talking into the correct part of it now. So hopefully you're able to hear me a bit better because this is a one woman operation and I'm figuring this out as I go along. So welcome to the podcast. This is the fifth episode of the podcast and the first one since I've been iTunes official. So welcome to all the new fans who came to me from iTunes and, you know, shout out to all the fans who've been there since day one as I figure out what the hell I'm doing. So this is a podcast where I look at the stories of women from history and then we score them at the end based on their the four categories, which are scandaliciousness, scheminess, significance, and then we give them a bonus for how how much sexism might have impacted the things that happened to them. It's a fun ride. Welcome aboard. So the first episodes that we've done of the show, the first four episodes, we did one royal, two noble women, and one woman with connections to royalty. So in terms of women's history and the women's history that we're looking at on this podcast so far, similar to what I have personally studied is that of European, Western European women. As per the quote by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich that inspired this season, well-behaved women seldom make history. And I dive into that in some previous episodes. So if you've caught up to that, awesome. Or if not, briefly, basically what she was talking about in an essay when she said that 
instantly iconic phrase is basically the only time that women pop up in records are when perhaps when they get married, because there would be often documentation about that when they died, maybe when they had children, even when they were royal, sometimes you don't get all of those things. And even, even then you, you might not get anything more than that. The only women who you hear more about are people who, I guess, for lack of a better term, misbehaved. So people who somehow stepped outside of the status quo and what was expected of them in society. And that's who we know about. And there were so many, I'm sure, amazing, cool women who were well-behaved and we just don't know what they were up to. And that sucks. And hopefully we can look at their stories somehow once time travel is invented and we can go back and learn their stories. But until then, the ones that I'm personally choosing to look at for this podcast are the women who, especially for the season, quote unquote, misbehaved. And so we've looked at people with connections to the nobility, to the royalty. And today's topic is a woman who had no connections to either. She was an absolutely standard issue, peasant woman. And what happened in her life is why we know about her. And this is so messed up. Here we go. So we're looking at the story of Mary Toft, who I'll give a little content warning just because we're going to get into this is vulgar history. In the name of the topic of the of the show, you see that I'm going to maybe say some some vulgar things. I might have a swear word here or then. Um, all the podcasts so far that I've uploaded, actually, I've had to put the explicit filter on. So this is like, prepare yourselves. But also today, we're going to be like, not shying away from the gynecological details of some absolutely horrific stuff that involved vis-a-vis dead animal parts inside of her vagina. So just content warning, that's not for everybody. And we're going to be talking about that a lot for the next, like, meh, 45 minutes. So here we go. The story begins with the parents, whose names are Jane and John Denyer. They were, so when we say, like, working class, like, or even high class or lower class, like, basically, this is the year 1703 is when Mary was born. And so it was a sort of situation where you've got sort of, like, your nobility, your aristocracy, you've got your royals. And then you've kind of got like really poor people, like homeless level people. And then you've kind of got like the working poor. And that's kind of what they were more than like working class. I'd say they were like the working poor. So John and Jane Denyer, they had five children overall, all together. um, And their oldest was a girl named Mary. So she was born Mary Denyer and she was baptized February 21st, 1703. And like a lot of people, not just women, not just working poor people, but just like anyone in general, even like royals, people whose every action you think would be written down, like no no one really knows much about what she got up to because no one really wrote down a lot of what anyone was getting up to because everyone was too busy working the fields, etc. But when she was 17 years old, Mary Denyer married a man or a boy. She was 17 and her husband was 18-year-old Joshua Toft. And so this is young to be married, even then, even though there's sort of this sort of misconception slash myth that people got married when they were like 12 or whatever back then. And I mean, like, yeah, betrothals happened between rich people. But for a 17-year-old girl to marry an 18-year-old boy, probably either they were in love or she was pregnant or one or the other or both. So basically, they got married in the year 1720. And Joshua Toft's family becomes important. So we're going to dive a little bit into who they were and what that whole situation was. So Joshua Toft was the sixth of 12 children. And his family, the Tofts, were better off than Mary's family, the Deniers. So they had been working for several centuries, like literally hundreds of years, as clothiers. And this is the sort of thing like we're seeing these days with people talking about like, you know, agriculture industry or like coal mining or things where it's like, this was a thing of family occupation business that people did for a really, really long time, but then sort of industrial change and times change and the weather and whatever makes it less tenable as a career choice. And so for them, their choice of being clothiers was not doing super well by the year 1720, which is when Joshua married his friend Mary. So a clothier in this, sen- in this sense 
basically means somebody who is in charge of sort of a fabric slash clothing making organization. So the clothier would be people, the head bosses, they would sort of employ people who would shear the sheep, they would employ the people that would like turn that into wool, they would hire the people who made that wool into fabric, like it's a whole sort of fashion empire situation. But basically, the Tofts had been, they had sort of made their fortune and their reputation through this successful clothiery business. But by 1720, they were sort of more on the shearing sheep level of work than the like overseeing an entire company level, but they still called themselves clothiers on census documents. So that's still kind of how they presented themselves. So like the Toft family had a good pedigree, but they weren't especially financially well off and especially Joshua being the sixth of 12 children there wasn't a lot of money to for him personally to inherit or to have though he himself worked in the family clothier business as well so Mary and Joshua's first child was a daughter named Mary which is just a thing that people used to do that I wouldn't mind seeing come back again which is that daughters were given the same names as their mothers I think it's cute. So Mary Toft had a daughter, also called Mary Toft, who was born sometime around when they were married, probably around 17, let's say 21. And then in 1723, Mary gave birth to a second child, a daughter whose name was Anne. Amazing name. I'm also in favor of people being called Anne. But this Anne unfortunately died of smallpox aged around four months, which is awful. And then the next year, they had a son whose name was James. So it's 1724. Mary has been married for four years. So she's 21 years old, mother of three. She and James were renting a home from a farmer. And as this is like not a weird arrangement, this is just like what, what was up. So they rented a home from a farmer. And as a condition of living there, they worked for the farmer in his fields. So this meant that during her three pregnancies and then also like postpartum, like just after having had the babies, she would be not just working in the fields, but also basically walking, commuting to the fields. And it was basically it was something like a two hour walk there, two hour walk back. The work was very physical work. And that was just what the situation of her life was. So Mary worked in the fields more than her husband did because he also had to dedicate some of his time to being a clothier. He was a journeyman clothier, which is like one step up of an apprentice, I think. So he was sort of like on this career path, but there weren't very many jobs for clothiers. So he was basically a poorly paid laborer slash working on the farmland of the place where they were renting slash his wife was also working on that same farmland. And that is what is going on in their lives. So just to set the scene. So by the time they were both 25 years old, they were the parents of uh, two small children, one of whom had recently just died. They're both working physically demanding low paying jobs in a community where the Tofts used to be wealthy, but now weren't anymore. And Mary was pregnant again. So as far as they knew, there's going to be one more mouth to feed any minute now. More money would be fantastic and also less backbreaking work and also her getting to put her feet up, but that's not going to happen. So in August 1726, so again, Mary is 25 years old. Yes, 25-ish years old. She has a miscarriage. So this story, as I mentioned at the beginning in the content warning, has a lot of gynecological information involved in it. And a lot of it is self-reported gynecological information from Mary Toft, who was a woman living in the early 1700s, who, which was a time when even the doctors didn't know what was going on in terms of a uterus, a cervix. So she's just sort of like saying, here's what it felt like to me. So what she later described this miscarriage as was she described passing an object as big as her arm and then experiencing a flooding, quote unquote, that lasted about a week. So we can assume some cramps were happening. We can assume bleeding was happening. The other women who she worked with in the fields likely would have covered for her because she couldn't do this whole job she was doing. She couldn't commute there. But what was unusual to her 
and others about this was that her miscarriage didn't look like a baby. It looked like an object. And they, they all thought it looked, quote unquote, monstrous. So Mary Toft went back to work as soon as she could. But then three weeks later, while she was out working in the field, she experienced further flooding. This is the word that she used herself to describe what was happening. So I'm guessing bleeding, cramping situations and great pain. So this was some sort of, it was like a two part miscarriage situation, perhaps. um, And this is where I'm just going to say that I, off the record, consulted with a woman who I know who is a obstetrician slash gynecologist just to say like, here's what Mary Toft was saying. What do you think this was? And so she said, again, totally just like, you know, in those magazine articles where it's like the body language expert is like, ooh, here's what this means. When this person put her arm like this in the picture, it's like this person didn't actually, is not the psychologist of these people. So the woman who I consulted, I just gave her, here's Mary Toft's recounting, what do you think this was? And so what she suggested, um, based on sort of the description of the miscarriage and what it looked like, the miscarriage situation might have been an incomplete molar pregnancy, M-O-L-A-R. So this is what happens when a non-viable fertilized egg implants in the uterus. So totally unpleasant, awful, traumatizing thing to happen to her. But at this point, her in-laws, the Toft family, thought like, well, what if this was a monster? And then we could get rich by saying, Mary Toft just gave birth to a monster. This is quite a turn in events. So we'll just take a step back to be like, why, why would anyone ever think that? And how would that make them rich? And the answer to that is basically freak shows. So English culture, as in culture in England at this time, was very interested in anything they saw as monstrous. So ambitious people could try to round up interesting people or quote unquote, monsters to take on exhibit to get rich. So basically you would take somebody, someone who's very tall or someone who's very short or someone whose body hair situation was unusual and you would take them to dinner parties. You would take them and put them on exhibitions. You'd make people pay to see this person and you would make money as their agent and the person would be probably horribly mistreated. So one year before Mary Toft's very significant miscarriage, a young boy known as Peter the Wild Boy had been very trendy to invite to your dinner party. So he was a boy who, you can Google this, Peter the Wild Boy, who had been basically found, he was like feral, I guess is the word people use. He, to us now, might say was like severely autistic or something, but basically he just acted in ways that people didn't expect boys to act. And he would be taken around and people would pay money to see him. So freak shows were also popular. And so the Toft family who, remember, they used to be pretty well off in their clothier business. Now they were less well off. They were like, this is it. This is how we're going to make our fortune. We're going to use our sister-in-law's horrible miscarriage situation to get rich quick. So the person who seems to have been the instigator of this whole scenario was Mary's mother-in-law, whose name was Anne Toft, and with an assist from Mary's sister-in-law, Anne's daughter, Margaret Toft. So Anne and Margaret are kind of the the schemers here. Mary Toft is just sort of like their unwilling but necessary accomplice. So from Mary's statements, which is, it's really a treasure trove of just sort of seeing how she herself perceived what was happening to her and what she thought about what was happening to her, etc. She presents herself as not having been on board for any of this. When we get to the details of what this is going to involve. It's like, yeah, of course she was not involved. Like she didn't want to do this stuff, but anyway, so Mary had her miscarriage in two parts. Um, and the object, the quote unquote object, the size of her arm, which is potentially this molar pregnancy, this has all been disposed of. It wasn't around anymore. So Mary and Anne, or sorry, Margaret and Anne couldn't show it to people as like, look at this crazy monster that she gave birth to. So as, as they needed something to present as proof, what the Tofts did was they either killed a cat. My cat is here with me while I'm recording that. And I'm just like, 
she and I are just like, we're not into this. Hepburn, I'm sorry, there's going to be some weird cat stuff in this story. So put your hands over your cat's ears. So they either killed a cat or found a dead cat, removed its guts, um, and then put a dead eel. I guess they also found a dead eel or killed an eel. So they put a dead eel inside of a vivisected cat carcass and then put this whole scenario up inside of Mary via her vagina. They put this dead cat with eel inside into Mary Toft's vagina, which is the name of the like canal inside. So Mary herself would later claim that the cat parts have been inserted into her cervix. And the cervix is like the part at the top of the vagina that like opens, but very rarely and only a little bit. Um, and my, my obstetrician slash gynecologist friend said basically like, no, like even after you've had a miscarriage or had a baby, like the cervix like seals itself back up. Like chances are there was not cat parts inserted up literally into her cervix, but that's what she thought had happened. And it probably felt just as shitty as that happening. Anyway, so here we have Mary um, with a dead cat carcass with eel inside of it inserted inside of her vaginal canal. And so she pretends she's in labor. And then as you did then, because remember she'd had the miscarriage. So maybe people still thought she was pregnant or something. No one really understood gynecology back then including the male doctors, but we'll get to them in a bit. So one of her neighbors came over to help and the neighbor came over and was like, oh my God, she just gave birth to a cat monster eel. And so she went to get Anne Toft, the mother-in-law slash person who invented this whole situation, who is also some sort of midwife person or said she was a midwife person or something like that. They, they were gathering witnesses is basically what was happening. And Toft came over and she's like, oh my God, did my daughter just give birth to a cat carcass with an eel inside of it? That's wild. And so she took the uh, quote unquote monster to a surgeon slash midwife who lived nearby so he could tell them what was going on. And the surgeon slash midwife is a man named John Howard. And to his credit, he was like, uh, this seems unlikely. Like, thank you so much for bringing me this, um, perhaps skinned vivisected cat carcass with eel inside of it and saying that it came out of a woman's vagina. But that is just like pretty hard for me to believe, but not just because that's like, of course it's hard for him to believe that's impossible. But his reasoning was like, there's not a head on this. And I guess they had cut the head off of the cat body. Mm, I'm just looking at my cat. It's like, mm, you poor little cat ancestors. So anyway, he was like, if Mary had actually given birth to this monster, there would be head on it, but there's not a head on this. Ergo, this woman didn't give birth to this monster. But he was like, so, so I'll just come over to the house and see what's going on. Because, you know, giving birth, maybe the head is there. I don't know what he was thinking. This whole situation gets like super weird, like even weirder. So John Howard came by and by the time he got there, Mary just happened to be going in, quote unquote, going into labor again. Um, her mother-in-law and delivered more dead cat bits, which I guess were from the same cat or a different cat. Like, does it matter? I don't know. So John Howard was like, hmm, like he witnessed this happening or he witnessed her, Mary screaming and then someone being like, look, this cat just came out of her or whatever. But there still wasn't a cat head or a cat tail. And he's like, great. I see that she may have just given birth to this monster situation, but again, without a head, I just can't get on board. So somehow, uh, Margaret and Anne Toft had lost track of the cat head and there wasn't another one nearby or whatever. So they decided to go for rabbit bits because the were rabbits were easier to come by than cats. And so they just wanted to stuff some dead animal up inside of Mary's vagina because this whole thing is a nightmare. So pause, a side note on rabbits in general, which is just to say that there was a lot of rabbits all over England at this time. Maybe there are still, I don't know. I don't live there, but hundreds of years before. So medieval lords, like back in the day, in the day, medieval lords had built uh, sort of little rabbit warrens to raise rabbits for meat and fur. So that the medieval lords could have the meat and the fur for their fancy medieval lord outfits and meals, etc. But rabbits cannot be tamed. 
So they escaped from these enclosures and became basically pests to the working poor, to lower status people, to the farmers, etc. So just rabbits, the whole Peter Rabbit situation. The rabbits would come into people's farms, eat all their lettuce, etc. So rabbits were all over the place, making them the easiest thing for the tofts to acquire. But also the rabbits had this sort of political implication as they were sort of seen as symbolic of the carelessness of the upper classes. So this is where the whole situation takes on a sort of political context that Margaret and Anne may or may not have consciously thought about, but that becomes part of the story as well, because this is just getting wilder. It's, I know we've already had an eel in a headless cat inside a woman's vagina and a doctor being like, "Mm, but with no head, did this happen? But this is going to get weirder. So what happened? Like flashback. What had happened was John Howard was still like, yeah, I see some rabbit parts just came out of this woman, but still no head. So I just can't, can't be on board. So basically, Anne Toft, who is the mother-in-law, inserted the upper jaw of a rabbit into Mary's vagina and then just like peaced out. She just left to be like, okay, Mary, like give birth to this in the morning. I'm not sure. Mary was in a horrible amount of pain because the uh, upper jaw had pointy bits on it like bones. And so she called for help and somebody helped remove that from inside of her. But then the next day Anne came back and she was like, ugh, you've got that, like, we need to have a head inside your vagina. So then she forced the rest of the rabbit skull inside of Mary, such that by the time that John Howard arrived, Mary was bleeding. I mean, legitimately bleeding from her inside vagina area, not just from having like very recently had a miscarriage, but also from the like having had a rabbit skull inserted and then removed from her vagina. So John Howard was like, huh, you know what? This looks like a head. I guess this is a monster. So now I'm on board. So just side note on John Howard in general. So basically he was not just like this altruistic man midwife running around helping women etc he was somebody who was like oh man if he if she gave birth to a monster i john howard can also become rich as the guy who delivered the monster babies so there's a lot of money in it for him in this so he might have been fooled by this but i think it's more likely that he was kind of in on it likely teaming up with ann toft the mother-in-law but basically from this point like he did not change his perspective. He had no doubts at all. He was like into this situation. He supported what the Tofts were saying. And he was like, I am the man who delivered the rabbit monsters. Such that he uh, started giving money to the Toft family every time Mary gave birth to another part of rabbit because her doing that was like good business for him in some sort of way, apparently. So what happens next is that So now that, so they had done like the cat with eel, but that didn't quite work because of the head situation. So now there was a rabbit head, but also other rabbit bits. So the Toft family started coming up with a sort of an explanation for why this human woman was starting to give birth to rabbit bits. And the story that they decided on and the story that Mary started telling people and the story that you still hear um, sometimes when this story is told as a legend is that Mary began to claim that she dreamed of rabbits throughout her actual pregnancy, the one that had ended with a miscarriage. And she said that during the whole time she was pregnant, she'd had a craving to eat rabbits. She was just like thinking about rabbits during the whole pregnancy. And so their explanation was basically she thought about rabbits so much during the pregnancy, her baby was a rabbit, basically, which is wild and very strange conjecture but this all ties in with some of the medical science of the day which basically talked about the importance of quote-unquote prenatal influence like basically whatever pregnant women think about can affect their babies like not in a 21st century way where you put headphones on your belly and like play baby mozart or whatever but sort of like if you dream about rabbits you will give birth to rabbits sort of way and so for financial reasons and also to I don't know, because they'd figured out a plan and they were just like, we're good at it now. Mary started delivering entire rabbits on a daily basis, piece by piece from out of her vagina. John Howard delivered them all 
His were the unwashed 18th century hands reaching up inside of her. Over and over again, the fact she didn't die is incredible because doctors back then didn't wash their hands um, between, for instance, I also learned this from my doctor friend. So the reason that some women, many women, died in childbirth in this, this sort of situation, including potentially Jane Seymour, the third wife of Henry VIII, is because doctors used to do like autopsies and cut up and whatever dead people, maybe wipe their hands on their apron, maybe not even, and then go and like deliver a baby by like putting the hand up inside the vagina of the woman. And then the woman will get a horrible infection and die. And now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going... If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more, sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today shopify.com slash realm. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a co-founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. During her journey, Isla meets new friends, including King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and learns valuable life lessons with every quest, sword fight, and dragon ride. Positive and uplifting stories remind us all about the importance of kindness, friendship, honesty, and positivity. Join me and an all-star cast of actors, including Liam Neeson, Emily Blunt, Kristen Bell, Chris Hemsworth, among many others, in welcoming the Search for the Silver Lining podcast to the Go Kid Go Network by listening today. Look for the Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600-person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know. Horrifying, right? Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart-Robbins, and I am the host and creator of the podcast, Only One in the Room. Every week, my co-host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. And we're back. So the fact that she... Mary Toft was having these rabbit parts put inside of her vagina and then John Howard repeatedly delivering them. It's incredible she didn't die from this, which, spoiler, she doesn't. So he was delivering the pointy claws of dead rabbits from her vagina. Like, so it wasn't like a whole rabbit all up all at once. It was like parts at a time. And so over the course of like a day, she would quote unquote, deliver a whole rabbit with her mother and sister, mother-in-law and sister-in-law, the ones like helping to slide the bits up inside of her. But Mary was the one who had to like spread her legs and deliver these rabbit parts. So basically at this point, John Howard had, was spending so much time with her and her like rabbit birth situation that he entirely moved his entire medical practice so he could be with her 24 hours a day because one never knew when a new rabbit part might need to be delivered. And he was the doctor that delivered the rabbit babies. So by the end of November, 1726, Mary Toft had given birth to, did you hear my little quotes? Quote unquote, given birth to 12 complete rabbits piece by piece from her vagina. 
they like the pieces were put up, the pieces were removed, 12 rabbits. So sometimes she had to keep rabbit bits up inside of her for days or even weeks so that John Howard wouldn't see them being put inside. And again, the fact she didn't die of a blood infection is really speaks to the resiliency of her immune system. So while this was all going on, so John Howard was like, this is great. I'm the man who delivered the rabbits, but they weren't getting as famous as he wanted or as the Tofts had obviously also wanted. Mary, again, I don't think this was what she wanted for herself, but she would get some of the money as well. Basically, they're like, we just, how do we take this to the next level? Which is like, oh my God, like what is the next level of this? So we'll find out. So what happened is John Howard wrote letters to every rich and important person he knew, hoping for more publicity, which would bring him more money and glory. And to be prepared, he pickled all the rabbit bits that he delivered. Um, and he offered to like take his little jars of pickled rabbit bits. He could bring them to your dinner party. He could bring them to your soiree. He could bring them to your medical lecture and he could talk about it. So basically he was blabbing about this so much that basically eventually a small notice came up in a newspaper in London saying like, hmm, this woman's been giving birth to rabbits. Like, isn't that weird? And that newspaper article gained the attention of, <laughs> of some men who served the king. Um, some of the courtiers of the king at this time was King George I. And one of the people who noticed this or who heard about it from the newspaper article was the king's personal physician, which is a man named Nathaniel St. Andre. And so now this takes, this whole story takes its next mega twist moment, courtesy of the king in St. Andre. So first of all, a note on King George I. So he was the grand nephew, it's not the grandson, but the grand nephew of Queen Anne I as played by Olivia Colman in The Favourite. So if you remember from The Favourite, also a movie with a lot of rabbits in it, also related to fertility. So the Queen Anne I had given birth to so many children, and sadly, none of them survived childhood. She had a huge number of miscarriages as well. So basically, she was the queen, and no one knew who would inherit from her because she did not have any surviving children. So basically, because she died without any living heirs, and she was Protestant, and nobody wanted a Catholic to inherit. They just sort of looked at her family tree to figure out, like, who is the next closely related to her Protestant person? And that was George. So the thing about George is he was German, and he never learned how to speak English, despite being the king of Britain. And he spent most of his reign, like, literally living in Germany, not even in England. All of which to say, when it came time for George I to hire a personal physician to be his doctor in England, he was like, well, as long as the doctor speaks German, that's fine. So as his doctor, he chose Nathaniel St. Andre, who was from Switzerland, who spoke German, and who's also a terrible doctor, slash even worse person, slash, uh, okay, so we'll get into it. So Nathaniel St. Andre <laughs> had a long history of odd behavior. If you, there's not time in here to get into all of the Nathaniel St. Andre of it, but his story involves like wife stealing, his story involves poisoning, his story involves like, was he even really a doctor? Like he was just a messy bitch who lived for drama, Nathaniel St. Andre. So he happened to find himself caught up in weird scandals a lot more than basically anybody else because he loved scandal. He loved drama. And if there was a scandal happening, he would like fling himself into the middle of it because he was desperate to keep his name in the newspapers as this like famous eccentric genius. So he just really wanted to be associated with anything dramatic. John Howard just wanted money, basically. And Mary Toft is just like this person in the middle of all these other people's wild ambitions, which is such a common, I mean, not this story, not the rabbit vagina situation of it all. But it's such a common thing of like a bunch of men are just really ambitious about something and they see a way to get power. And the way to do it is just by using a woman, like to a different extent. This is sort of the story of uh, the beginning of Queen Elizabeth the First's reign. But anyway, Mary Toft is having, I mean, she's suffering. She's physically suffering. Like having rabbits pulled out of your vagina every day having to put in and then pull out 
the pointy bits. Like she just had a miscarriage. Like, are you, ugh. anyway, so she's just like, she didn't want this. She didn't want this, but more and more people around her are just like counting on her to keep doing this so that they will get rich or more powerful or whatever. So basically the story of her rabbit births by now had gotten so locally famous that you know, there wasn't paparazzi or whatever, but basically she couldn't stay in her little house that they were renting from the farmer who was also her boss. So she's moved to a bigger town. Um, John Howard came along with her to live in this town where she just continued. And, you know, helpfully, her mother-in-law and sister-in-law came along too, so they could like procure rabbit carcasses and shove them up inside of her. Actually, um, the person who was procuring the rabbit carcasses was her husband, Joshua. Remember him? from back before this story got so distressing. So he's basically running around buying dead baby rabbits from whatever, I don't know, rabbit vendors there are. And he was not being discreet whatsoever. Like later the rabbit vendors would be like, he would come up and say stuff like, yeah, need to buy some rabbits for my wife. Like, do you have any dead rabbits? It'd be great if they were dead baby rabbits. My wife needs dead baby rabbits. No reason. So... It was not a smooth operation. Ocean's Eleven, it is not. So anyway, Nathaniel St. Andre was like, I'm into this. And so he swept up in town just in time to personally witness Mary's 15th rabbit birth. So Nathaniel St. Andre, horrible person, messy bitch who lived for drama, technically the king's personal physician in England, but also just like, also a terrible doctor. So he personally helped her deliver one of these rabbits and then he ran off to autopsy it to see like what's going on you know like is this some sort of human fetus that looks like a rabbit like what's the deal and so it's at this point that one of the things he did was he took the lungs of the rabbit put them in water and they floated and the reason he did that was to see like if they floated that means that those lungs had breathed air and so the rabbit seemed to have been born dead but like if the lungs had air in them, that means that the rabbit at some point breathed, which means it probably didn't grow inside of Mary Toft's uterus. But he was not ready to, to debunk this. He was there to support it, basically. So he just like didn't really get too concerned about that. Like, I guess there's just air inside of her uterus. Like, why not? There's already rabbits growing there. So, and just after this autopsy, he went over, he was called back to her side again and witnessed the birth of another rabbit carcass and so now he also not just autopsying the the rabbit bits but he also examined her whole vaginal area did a little peeking around seeing what's up he's like "Mm, let's just see if there's any more rabbit parts hiding up inside here and he's like nope i don't see anything in there so i guess i guess you're not secretly putting rabbit parts inside your vagina and then he left but then he came back And he delivered another dead rabbit. And he was like, oh my God, I looked inside her vagina. There's no rabbit parts there. Then she delivered a rabbit. So like, I am convinced. But also he went in there like ready to be convinced. He didn't require much convincing. And then also later, like as much as one can love a detail in a story as profoundly fucked up as this story, I love this detail, which is in her later deposition, Mary explained that Like when he looked up inside her vagina, there were rabbit parts there. There literally were. He just didn't know what he was doing or what he was looking at vis-a-vis a a woman's vaginal canal. So like he was just such a useless and unqualified doctor that he didn't notice a rabbit carcass inside the vagina of a woman whose vagina he was inspecting to see if there was a rabbit in it. So basically poor her and Nathaniel St. Andre sucks and... And guess what? Story gets weirder. So by now, the king was kind of like, even from Germany, was like, "Mm, what's going on? This all seems a little weird. And he was like, "Eh, I kind of know Nathaniel St. Andre, messy bitch who lives for drama. So let's just like get like a objective third opinion on the situation. So he sent his other personal physician, who is named Syracius Allers. I'm going to call him Allers. Allers was the official royal doctor of the German royal family, which is the one that George cared more about. So he chose like an actual good doctor for there. Allers was, came into this whole thing, thank God, skeptical 
of the whole situation. He showed up basically like Mary Toft. I don't believe you've given birth to 15 rabbits. Prove me wrong. So from moment one, like he was not impressed with the whole clown car that was this whole scheme. So for instance, when he arrived, he showed up and Nathaniel St. Andre was like, oh, look, this rabbit skin. She just gave birth to this. You just missed it. And Allers was like, mm, I don't think so, because there's no blood or fluid on this rabbit skin whatsoever. There's literally no way this was just born out of either a human woman or a female rabbit. Also, he was just like looking in the room. He's like, oh, and also Mary Toff does not look pregnant at all. I feel like she's literally wearing a corset right now. And she's also walking around like holding her knees together like she's trying to make something not fall out of her vagina. So it's all just like a little suspicious. And Mary's like, oh, no, I'm going into labor. And Allers was like, OK, I'm going to take care of this situation. And despite him being skeptical, which made me sort of side with him a little bit, turns out he didn't know what he was doing at all vis-a-vis childbirth delivery. He was a doctor, but he was not a obstetrician, nor was he a gynecologist. So he reached his hand up inside of Mary to like help her give birth. But what he did is he accidentally shoved the rabbit higher up into her vagina, which is just like, oh, so Mary screamed in probably absolute genuine pain. And John Howard was like, "Mm, I got this. But so while John Howard, John Howard delivered the new rabbit carcass, Allers sneakily stole some of the rabbit bits and he like went off into his room. And then even though he was supposed to stay in town for three more days, he pretended that he had a headache and then he secretly left town with them. So again, he shoved the rabbit further up the vagina, but I I like Allers for his sneakiness here. So basically he just like crept out of town. I picture him climbing out a window. He probably didn't, but he might have. So in London, he took the rabbit bits and he did further testing where he found that A, the rabbits had had their muscles cut from their bones with sharp knives, not something that could have happened in utero. And B, the rabbits had pellets in their bums with corn and wheat and grass in them, meaning that the rabbits had eaten corn and wheat and grass, meaning they had not just been born. So similar to what Nathaniel St. Andre had found with the floating lungs, like these had been alive rabbits who were then killed and then put inside of Mary. Like they did not gestate inside of her. So he had absolute proof now, as much as one could have, you know, CSI 1726, he had proof that this was a hoax. So at this point, we picture Mary herself, just whatever the 18th century equivalent of holding frozen peas to your vulva would be, just like trying to make herself not hurt as much as she was obviously hurting both psychologically and physically. But... Nobody else, nobody, nobody cared about her because what happened next is that Allers, John Howard and St. Andre have basically a dick swinging contest about which of them was the smartest doctor, which basically was all three men kept like one would write a letter to the editors of the newspaper being like, Mary Toft is a hoaxer. And then one of them would write a letter being like, no, Allers is a hypocrite. And then one would write a letter being like, Nathaniel St. Andre is a messy bitch who lives for drama. And like Nathaniel St. Andre probably sent that one. So just a war of words, but not even about her, just between them about like who's the smartest and best doctor. Throughout all of this, Anne Toft kept shoving rabbit bits into her daughter-in-law. John Howard kept delivering them. And finally, just to settle this all, the king commanded an obstetrician, like, thank God, named Sir Richard Manningham, like, sir, like he was a knight, like he was such a trusted obstetrician. He was a knight of it to go and visit Mary Toft and figure out literally what the fuck was going on. So Richard Manningham goes to see Mary and he's like, hmm, so I don't see any rabbits inside her vagina. Her cervix seems closed as per usual for a person not actively giving birth to anything. Um, But then just after he left the room, John Howard was like, oh, I just, just after you left, look, she gave birth to these membranes. I guess he must not have noticed them when you were examining her. And Manningham looked at the membranes, which were clearly bits of a bladder from a pig that smelled like pig urine. And he was like, "Mm, I think this is a pig's bladder. Can you bring me like a pig's bladder to compare it to? And then someone did that because there's a pig's bladder around. I don't know. Um, And he's like, "Mm, yeah, this is clearly a pig's bladder. Uh, This is hashtag a hoax. And Mary just started crying. Like, honestly, of course she did. 
And so the men, the man doctors all agreed to bring Mary back to London for further examinations, which like, can't we just not have any more hands on her vagina ever again? Apparently not. So on to London. Now, at this point, what happens is St. Andre wanted her next rabbit birth to happen publicly, like in a theater, you know, like those theaters, like in, um, what's called the Nick, was that what it's called? The show about like the oldie time doctors where you like, or like in Frankenstein and stuff where like a doctor is in the middle of an auditorium and there's all medical students watching. So St. Andre wanted her to do that with everybody watching so that he could get fame and glory. But what happened when they got to London is Mary was for the first time, no one thought of this before, was put under basically round the clock surveillance. So there's no opportunity for anyone to bring her a rabbit to put inside of her vagina. So she didn't go into birth, so she couldn't have it happen in an auditorium anyway. But also just like, I hope she just like went in the room, whatever it was, like a jail room, a hotel room, and just like squeezed her legs together and just was grateful that her in-laws weren't there to do this to her again. But she was also at this point legitimately sick because obviously, because no kidding, because she probably had like a thousand various internal infections from all the hands they probably had gross pointy nails also the rabbit bits the skulls like of course she was sick basically she started having fits and the doctors were like oh these fits kind of look like she's going into labor but they were probably involuntary convulsions from various serious infections she was having and then a man was caught trying to smuggle a dead rabbit into her room and he when he was caught they were like why are you delivering this rabbit into her room and he was like because her sister-in-law margaret paid me to do that and the jig was up because he was not good at rabbit sneaking margaret toft the sister-in-law was brought in for questioning and she was like okay yes i hired that guy to sneak the dead rabbit into mary toft's room but not for vagina reasons it was because she likes to eat rabbits it was a special treat for her to eat a raw rabbit. And they were like, uh, sure. So then they went to talk to Mary and she was like, yes, is if that's what she said, then that's true. The rabbit was just for me to eat. So for two days, they interrogated Mary trying to get her to admit to the hoax and she wouldn't give in and she wouldn't give in because of family loyalty and like, I don't know, delusional blood infection brain. But eventually Manningham was like, okay, So if this is true, if you gave birth to whatever it is at this point, 17 rabbits, that means that there's something really fucked up inside of your like innards. So we just need to like literally vivisect you now, like cut you open in a surgical manner and look at your insides. And Mary was like, okay, please don't do that. It's a hoax. So December 7th, 1726, Mary dictated her confession And this is where we got a lot of the information from about the whole scenario because she came clean. So the first, first round confession version one, she claimed that she'd met a strange woman on the road who had suggested that she should put rabbits in her vaginas, pretend to give birth to them because that would be a way for her to never want as long as you live, like AKA would make her rich. And they were like, really a strange woman on the road told you this and then you just did it. Like that's okay like a little unbelievable. And Mary Toft was like, okay, version two, it wasn't a strange woman on the road. It was in fact, my in-laws idea. It was my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law. And she also said that John Howard was in on the scheme as well. And she was steadfast in all of her confessions that she herself was innocent in all of this. She didn't want to do this. Like who, who would ever have wanted to do this? Of course she didn't want to do this. So she was basically blaming other people, which is like, you know, people might do that when they confess, but for her, it's like, I believe her based on every reason in the world. But based on this confession, Mary was officially charged with a crime of being a notorious and vile cheat, which was a crime back then in that place and time. So she was put into prison and crowds would like mob outside, just like desperate to see the rabbit queen. And during this time period, she had a portrait painted of herself, which is like people like Mary Toft, like, aside from the whole rabbit vagina scenario, like she would have never probably had a portrait painted. So it's kind of, this is where it's like well-behaved women don't make history. Like we heard about Mary Toff because of this scheme. She only really got her portrait done because of this scheme. And so from that, we kind of see what she looks like, which is just sort of like a pleasant looking person. Of course, in the portrait, he painted her holding an alive rabbit in her lap because, you know, 
that's what the crowds would have wanted to see or whatever. So she's only in jail for three months. She was discharged mostly because the crime of being a notorious and vile cheat isn't easy to prosecute because it's kind of not a thing. But during the three months in jail, her health issues improved, partially because she wasn't having dead animal bits and unwashed men's hands forced into her vagina on a daily basis. So feeling better, bounced back. She returned back to her husband and her two children and her in-laws, which must have been so awkward because they are nightmare horrible people and got her in the situation in the first place. And about a year after, um, Mary Toft, now aged 26, although it feels like she's aged 100 years in this experience, she gave birth to uh, another daughter who she named Elizabeth. From then on, writers and newspapers and like, you know, cartoonists and things would still continue to bring up the story, especially because of the whole rabbit political angle. But Mary herself fades from public record almost entirely until she died in 1763. So when she died, her husband had died first because the parish register recorded her as Mary Toft, comma, widow. They noted after her name as well that she was the imposterous rabbit breeder. And although poor women from where she grew up weren't ever written about in London newspapers when they died, her obituary was actually published in the London newspapers alongside those of aristocrats because she was still so famous for this whole fucked up situation. So a couple of things I want to mention. First of all, there's a new biography coming out of Mary Toft. I'm really excited about it. It's called The Imposterous Rabbit Breeder. It's coming out in early 2020 and it's written by a researcher, a historian named Karen Harvey. And the thing that I'm really excited about with this book is that she's really making the book about Mary Toft, not about all the men and doctors who were around her. In researching this whole situation, there was a really great essay by, by the author of this book, Karen Harvey, that I read. All of the, my references are all, I'll put a link to them in the show notes. But basically, I'm really excited to read this book. Karen Harvey's point of view is really compelling. And she really puts a really person first spin on a story that's become sort of a myth at this point. Also just came out, I haven't read it yet, but there's a fiction, historical fiction novel written by Dexter Palmer called Mary Toft or the Rabbit Queen, which seems like the main characters in it are the men doctors. And there's certainly a lot of drama to be gleaned from imagining what they were up to. I read a lot of things to research this. I'll put the research notes. Um, I'll link to those in the post. I won't say them all out loud, but just know that there's a lot of interesting stuff out there discussing this topic, including um, the Lore podcast, episode number 45, First Impressions, which talks a bit about the myth around this whole situation. And now it's the part in every episode of Vulgar History where we score this. And this is a weird one because it's like Mary Toft, I feel, I've read about her a lot and I feel like I know her and I feel like she didn't want this. She wasn't like, if we were scoring Nathaniel St. Andre, like he would get whatever high scores because he was all about the scheminess but mary toft i feel like was not in it for herself so the first category is a scandalousness and this is where even though she did she may or may not have wanted to do this like like whatever it wound up being i think 17 rabbits like giving birth to them from her vagina the like months long conspiracy of it it got up to the king she was sent to jail like the scandaliciousness is pretty high here. I think I'm going to give her a seven for scandaliciousness, partially because she did do it on purpose. Like it wasn't necessarily her idea, but it's just, I mean, it's a juicy, juicy scandal. Her scheminess, her personal scheminess, I think was not super high, which is to her credit, really. Again, we're not scoring her in-laws for them much higher score because they were the ones who came up with this. But that being said, Mary Toft stuck with it. She pretended to give birth to all these things. She stuck to her story. She didn't give up for, for two days of questioning. I'm going to give her a scheminess of four. The next category is the significance, which is like, had you heard of her before this? I'm guessing for a lot of you, not, because it's not a super famous story. Even if you've heard about the woman who gave birth to the rabbits, you may not know her name the significance of it, she didn't like, 
it fucked up the career of Nathaniel St. Andre, but like that would have happened anyway, because that was just how he lived his life. The significance I'm going to give her, ugh, the significance, I mean, I'm going to give her two, a two for significance, because, you know, it's being revisited. We're talking about it here. It's not, it's more significant than if it hadn't have happened, but it didn't change the course of world history. The final category is where we give her bonus points based on how much sexism played a part in this situation. And I'm going to give her an eight for that because she was, uh, I could even go higher because she was so helpless in this situation. Like her in-laws, like regardless of the fact they were women doing this to her, like she was stuck in a situation where she was so helpless when the male doctors came in like she had no say in anything that was going on she was just a victim of everybody oh you know what no i'm going to give her a seven a seven for sexism so gives her a total of 14 15 18 19, 20 this gives her a score of 20 which is tied with caroline of brunswick which i think is respectable but they're tied with the smallest amount right now the two of them so yeah that was I think officially the most fucked up story I've told on this podcast yet. So I do want to reiterate that in 2020, a biography of Mary Toft and this whole situation came out called The Imposterous Rabbit Breeder, Mary Toft and 18th Century England by Karen Harvey. And I based my research for this episode on some articles Karen Harvey had written. And she's kind of like, she's the Mary Toft person. She's the expert. So to read more about this, to learn more about the story. I really recommend that book. God, it's just like, yay, welcome to a new year. Mary Toft. That's how we roll here on Vulgar History. So I want to remind you of just a couple of things I always remind you of, which is first of all, like Minty sent me that message. I do always appreciate hearing from you and you can message me. My DMs are open on Instagram at Vulgar History Pod. There's also a contact me form at vulgarhistory.com or you can email me directly at vulgarhistorypod at gmail.com if you want to get merch. I don't have Mary Toft merch at the moment, although I have been slowly, I had the merch store, which is kind of like designs I had made. And then I switched where the merch store is. And now I've been paying human artists to make beautiful (laughs) merchandise for the show. Um, And I really am happy with how that's going. And I'm kind of slowly adding back some of the designs from before. There used to be a picture of Mary Toft and it said, fuck everything. And I feel like that's a vibe I feel often. So maybe, you know, do you, that's the sort of thing. Let me know. Do you want Mary Toft merch again? Let me know by messaging me. But the merch that we do have is available at vulgarhistory.com slash store. Or if you're outside the U.S., the shipping is a bit better. If you go to vulgarhistory.redbubble.com, you can also support the podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash Ann Foster Writer, where for $1 a month, you get early ad-free access to all episodes. And for $5 or more a month, you get early ad-free access to episodes, as well as bonus episodes of Vulgar Peace Theater. So this asshole, the after show, and also people at the $5 or more a month get access, or I guess exclusive (laughs) invitations into the salon, the Vulgar History Salon, which is our Discord group chat, which is just a fun place to talk with TSO Brigade members. You can get transcripts of recent episodes at vulgarhistory.com. You just click on the episode, and then if the transcript is ready, you just scroll down and it's right there. And thank you so much to Evelyn Malik from The Wordery, who provides these transcripts. And she's working newest episodes backwards. So if you want to see the transcript to an episode from 2021, probably not there yet, but it will be eventually. Anyway, thank you so much for being listeners of this podcast. I'll be back at you next week with one last blast from the past episode until we, so I guess in two weeks, that's my um, soft launch to the fact that new episodes will be coming soon, soon, soon. So anyway, until next time, my friends, keep your pants on and your tits out. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Ann Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. Talmur, Sheshin Mughachi. Talmur is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready, for a great evil is coming, and death follows with it. 
Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Ah, the web tour. Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's that, Jerry? This is how you deal with me! No! <laughs> do not harm my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to! Do you know what lies within nothing? Rocket is in trouble, Akasa! Can, can we turn on the windshield remotely? No, she could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar. No, but you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! I don't like free falling! Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestall. We're the Ghost Story Guys. And every two weeks, we explore first-person stories of encounters with the paranormal from all around the world. Then we have some fun reacting to those stories. We like to say our goal is to scare the hell out of you, then make you laugh. Belief in the paranormal is not required. All you need is a love of great storytelling and curiosity about the world around you. Subscribe to the Ghost Story Guys now on your favorite podcatcher to hear episodes like High Strangeness in Chicago, The Mystery of Missing Time, and The Haunting of Vietnam, along with dozens of others. We've talked about mythical bridges, doppelgangers, haunted seaside towns, and so much more. Remember that story about the guy who was trapped inside a dream and something was hunting him? That was... that was upsetting. Yes. Yes, it was. Want us to help ruin your sleep? Come find the Ghost Story Guys on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else fine podcasts live, or at ghoststoryguys.com.